morning to everyone and thank you very much for, for the floor and uh, actually <laughs> accommodating my, my agenda. I apologize very much, I will have to leave uh, very early, but I am still, um, I'm still glad that, that I am here. And I started to participate in, uh, in PCF uh, World Summit uh, in uh, 2009. Um, and I, I, I saw it as an as a initiative coming from the private sector, from, from businesses that, that saw the need and opportunity in the development of uh, product carbon footprinting. I come from, from the public sector, from policy-making institution. I represent the European Commission, uh, which is the executive part of European, uh, European Union, of three European uh, institutions. Our role is, uh, is first to initiate policy, uh, public policies, and second to, to implement uh, and enforce them. Um, when I came uh, for the first time back in 2009, I spoke about uh, initial activities within the Commission about product carbon footprinting, and I felt, even I tried to explain it in, in broader policy context, I felt that that, uh, the, that that particular policy area was somehow orphaned within the, the, the European uh, policy, policy framework. And I am happy that today I can, I can tell you that it is not the case anymore, that since 2009, we have been working and developed uh, a new policy framework uh, where product carbon footprinting and environmental footprinting fits uh, very well. So uh, today I would like to speak about, uh, as it was introduced, about uh, EU environmental footprinting policy initiative, but I want to focus more on, on policy framework and, and explain a little bit where we are and when we are heading. And I will, there will be my colleague from the, from the Joint Research Center in the afternoon. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, this uh, research center, which is a sort of scientific branch of European Commission, uh, these people, these are the guys who actually work on technical aspects. So he will, will follow my presentation with, uh, uh, with more detailed and technical explanation what's, uh, what's going on. So, uh, the, the policy framework that I am going to speak about is the, is the emerging resource efficiency policy of the European Union. And let me very briefly go through rationale, what is behind, why we, we need uh, resource efficiency policy. One reason is that uh, historically there, is, there has been growing use of natural resources. Uh, and when I speak about natural resources, I mean, uh, I, I, I define natural resources in, in very broad sense, so it is not only energy carriers and, and materials, but all, uh, all um, uh, resources that the environment provides as input into our economic, economic systems. So whatever and however we measure it, there, there has been uh, increasing trend in the use of natural resources. And, and we start to understand that at least for some of those natural resources, there are, there are limits. Our planet is finite and for certain resources, uh, uh, we, we see unsust unsustainable uh, um, patterns of, of, of use. So just few, uh, the, the graph, uh, in, the, in the right upper corner is, it, it shows the growth in, uh, in fossil fuel, minerals, uh, metals, and what is it? Uh, biomass. So, so major, major material inputs into, um, into our economy. And if you combine it with the population growth and with increased income and, and increased consumption as driver of, of, uh, of the use of resources, you can see that this can be actually uh, unsustainable. And what is the result? It is not only that I want to paint a sort of uh, apocalyptic picture here, but the consequence is also that there is growing competition for resources, and we can see it in the, uh, in the growth of prices of, uh, of many natural resources in, in recent years, despite the fact that in, b before there was a period of steady, steady uh, decrease of, of, of the price, but but recently, 
prices of commodities were very volatile and, I, and we believe that it was caused by, uh, by scarcity of resources and bottlenecks in, in, in the supply of resources. <clears throat> Another reason is, and this is, this is my slide, international aspects of, of the resource use. Our European economy, our own consumption actually uh, is based on, on uh, utilization and exhausting uh, resources elsewhere. These four pictures actually show how we import carbon, carbon footprint, how we import land and, and, and soil nutrients in form of agriculture products, how we import uh, materials in uh, our, our domestic, domestic material consumption in Europe has been stabilized for some time, but what is growing is embedded sort of rucksack of materials that, that every semi-finite product that we import uh, carries with itself. And on the right side there is, this is water, sort of flow, international flow of water. So again, we import a lot of water, even from sub-Saharan uh, Africa uh, to Europe. So we are really, our, our livelihood is based on, on resources that we, that we, that we use uh, from elsewhere. Uh, but I, I, I don't only have negative messages. Uh, I think this policy is not only motivated by sort of sensing problems in future, but it is also based on, on understanding enormous opportunities. And I think in this very difficult time of, of crisis, uh, we believe that resource efficiency is also a part of, of solution, how European economy can become more competitive and, and resilient. Uh, so this shows uh, sort of uh, correlation between resource efficiency of different uh, European member states and competitiveness index. So we see that more resource efficient countries are actually also more competitive. So <clears throat> this is very briefly what, what, what was behind, why we embarked on, on, on this. And we arrived to, uh, <clears throat> we, we did a lot of studies, we also initiated creation of of international resource panel within, within UN that, that has carried out uh, several studies to, to, to understand global situation in, in resource use and associated environmental impact. And this is very simplified uh, analysis. So uh, I, I will focus here on the lowest, lower part of the, of the picture, which is barriers to, to resource efficiency. And we still see a lot of knowledge gaps, uh, focus of, of policies, but not only policies, but also business behavior on, on, on short-term uh, short uh, aspects and objectives. There are still policy inconsistencies. We have many policies in place that actually encourage uh, inefficient use of, of resources. There are more structural reasons. We have infrastructure that, that has very long lifetime and it is very expensive to abandon this infrastructure and to build build new one that would allow us to to do uh, to produce and, and, and uh, consume in in more sustainable way. But perhaps uh, what is what is most important is market distortions. Uh, the, the the price uh, doesn't always uh, express all environmental uh, environmental impacts through the life cycle, uh, our taxation policies and, and all other financial and fiscal instruments not always actually provide the right signals to companies and, and consumers, institutional and uh, individual. So these are, these are the, 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 the problems that we, we try to address in the resource efficiency policy. And there is emerging policy architecture Back in March 2010, the European Commission, and, and uh, it was followed by, by all 27 member states, adopted EU 2020 strategy, which is uh, economic strategy uh, until 2020. And this, this strategy is built on seven what we call flagship initiatives. And one of those seven flagship initiatives is resource efficiency. Uh, other related flagship initiative is, is a new industrial policy and, uh, and uh, innovation policy. 
There are, of course, interlinkages, but I, I will focus on, on resource efficiency. This, uh, this uh, high-level economic strategy was followed by a series of policy uh, strategic documents. Uh, and the, the last one, and I will focus on that, is, is the doc document that was adopted uh, a couple of weeks ago, which we call a Resource Efficiency Roadmap. This roadmap outlines what are objectives of this policy, what we want to achieve. So what, uh, at, at, at macro level, we want to achieve absolute uh, decoupling of economic growth from resource use and from the environmental impacts. We want to create new economic uh, opportunities. We want to ensure security of supply of critical resources and we want to limit the environmental impact of, of resource use. Uh, this, this document, the, the Resource Efficiency Roadmap, was, at least we tried to, to do it as a, as a visionary document, as, as a transformational agenda for Europe for, for next uh, decade. Uh, so it provides long-term objective, Vision 2050, it also provides a sort of intermediary objectives, we call them milestones there, but it also outlines series of actions that should be implemented within next two, three years by the, by the Commission. And, and here, when we look at, at, the, at the actions, we, we can see also how resource efficiency is, you know, it is, it is a very complex issue and we have to address it from many different angles. And if we miss one element, we probably fail. So this is another, another important message of resource efficiency, that we, we have to have a policy mix that, that combines and addresses all bottlenecks and, and systemic failures. We, we need to get prices right, so we need to remove uh, harmful subsidies. We need to, to get our fiscal, fiscal systems uh, to, to support resource efficiency. For example, to shift taxation from labor to, to tax, taxation of, uh, of resources. Uh, labor is heavily uh, taxed in, in, in Europe and we saw an enormous increase in labor productivity in past decades. We didn't see such corresponding uh, resource productivity growth uh, in past, so perhaps this should be done. The, Innovation is a key, of course. Innovation policies will, will play a very important role. But another element that was identified in, uh, in the resource efficiency roadmap as important area for action is boosting resource efficiency in production, consumption, and waste management. I would like to invite you to, to read the, the roadmap and, and you will find the, the link uh, there, so please go there. I, I, am, I don't have time to, to speak more about about the roadmap, although I, I would like to because uh, I'm very much excited about that, but I want to focus uh, on, on this particular element, this area of actions. And, and there, it is clear, it is implicitly, but in, in many places also explicitly, it is expressed that life cycle approach and what we do here, quantification of, of uh, life cycle, carbon emissions or, or, or carbon footprint and life cycle uh, environmental impacts, environmental footprint is very important, uh, very important tool, very important instrument uh, in whatever policies will be proposed in this, in this framework. So specific actions, I selected actions where I see direct implications for this group of people and for the, for the subject matter of, of this meeting. So there are actions related to or, ask, or calling for strengthening of green public procurement, uh, for providing guidance to member states and the private sector on methodology to assess the environmental performance of products. Uh, there is a call to address the environmental footprint of, uh, of products to, to, to uh, limit it. Then to increase market rewards for environmentally friendly products, better performing products, measures to extend uh, producer responsibility throughout the life cycle of, of products. So you can, you can see that, that life cycle as, uh, assessment 
is essential, is a core element of whatever policy, concrete policy action, concrete policy instruments will be, will be proposed and implemented. And what, uh, what it can be, I, I can't tell you exactly what, what the Commission will propose. This is, we are in the phase when we define different policy options. We look at, at policy instruments that exist, like la labeling systems, eco-design directive, which sets minimum requirements for product, energy efficiency label, and uh, other, other existing policies, and how they can be modified, improved, so that they better integrate uh, resource efficiency. Uh, but we, we don't want to exclude at this stage new instruments. So, so we, are, we are trying to, to identify all policy options and do ex ante assessments to, to see what is, what is effective, uh, how efficient these instruments are. Uh, so possible, possible applications of, uh, of life cycle assessment in broader sense and environmental carbon and environmental footprint methodologies um, can, can take place in the context of green public procurement, uh, in the context of existing eco-labeling uh, scheme in Europe, in the context of eco-design. There, there is policy concerning green claims and unfair commercial practices, so we think that that's there. Uh, uh, LCA can be used in uh, and sort of um, um, verifiability of environmental claims based on life cycle performance, performance of products could be, could be demanded in future. Uh, a new system for, for product declaration, carbon declaration or environmental declaration could be, could be also foreseen. Very important area, incentives. This is very, very broad uh, area because there are many different kind of incentives that markets and governments give to, to different kind of products. So we, we want to, we are now analyzing how in incentives, different kind of incentives could be improved to, to give the right signals. And again, we believe that life cycle assessment uh, could play a very important role there. And when I speak about uh, incentives, one type of incentives that needs to be considered is fiscal instruments. So we are evaluating also possibility to, to, have, uh, to, to apply fiscal instruments like differentiated VAT rate for, for products based on, uh, on uh, environmental or carbon footprint. Uh, to be able to implement such instruments, we have to have robust, reliable methodology. And this is what we are working on intensively. Our colleagues in, in uh, the Joint Research Center have already uh, developed draft methodological guides. So, so these, the, our work focuses on, on, on development of, of methodology for measurement of environmental footprint for products on one side and for companies. Uh, on, the, on the other side. Then we want to follow this work uh, by development of product category rules and sector rules for companies. Um, we also see that data development is a very important uh, element, so uh, we want to support uh, JRC to, to continue in, uh, in the work on the European life cycle data reference system and the in, in international life cycle data reference system. We see that there may be opportunity for international organizations like UNEP to facilitate uh, data, life cycle data exchange and development at international level to bring together partners from, from Europe uh, Japan and, and, and other Southeast Asian countries, United States, uh, Australia, and whoever would like to participate uh, uh, in, in this cooperation. And what is important is also uh, approximation of methodologies used in, in different regions, different uh, countries. Here, standardization bodies can play an important role, but also uh, other organizations that are that are present here 
WRI, uh, etc. Et so, what is the time frame for these activities? Uh, concerning methodological development, uh, I mentioned we, we have already developed drafts for, uh, for methodological, methodological guides for measurement of environmental footprints of products and companies. These drafts are in the road testing phase and we hope that we will be able to finalize and adopt these guides at the end of 2012. And then we want to run a few pilot projects on PCRs and, and sectoral rules, but then essentially we would like to facilitate and support industry to to, to develop PCRs uh, as, as private initiatives based on agreed set of rules. On uh, data development, I already mentioned, we very much uh, rely on, uh, on existing structures, uh, e uh, ELCD and ILCD, and we are considering uh, sort of asking asking UNEP to, to, to play a more active role in international coordination. And the policy instruments that I, that I mentioned that we are currently evaluating, uh, the, the impact assessment that, that is ongoing should be finalized before, before April next year. On the basis of this impact assessment, we should be able to, to propose specific policy proposals uh, at the end of 2012, <clears throat> especially for voluntary initiatives that may be in the, in the form of recommendations and guidance, etc. But if we, if we need to adopt uh, mandatory instruments, legislative acts, uh, we see that this could come out from the Commission in the period 2013-2014. So, this is, this is the plan of the Commission, and uh, I, hope, I hope very much that I would learn about private initiatives and, and we can compare how these how this two, stream two streams of work compare and, and where there is, there is possibility for, um, for sort of informing each, each other and cooperation and uh, harmonization. Unfortunately, I will have to leave, but I, I leave my, my email address. If you have any question, please don't hesitate uh, to contact me. I would be happy to respond to your, to your questions. If you have any, any good ideas uh, what European policy should introduce in the area of carbon and, and, and product footprinting, I would be really happy to uh, to, to see your proposal and to consider, especially in this phase. I would say that next six months is critical for formulation of European policy in this area. So if you have, uh, if you have your opinion, uh, if you have good ideas, please don't hesitate to come back to, to us and uh, speak to us, propose what you, what you have in mind. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.